Good morning, Rivers Crossing. Come on, stand to your feet and clap your hands with us right there like this.
stand to hear I stand I am surrender I need you now hold my heart now and forever my soul cries out here I stand I am surrender I need you now hold my heart
Your grace holds the ground, and your grace holds me now. Your grace holds me the altars where you meet us take me there take me there if what you need is just an offering it's right here my life is here and i'll be a living sacrifice for you you're a fire the refiner I want to be consumed, I want to be tried by fire, purified, you take whatever you desire, Lord here's my life, I want to be tried by fire, purified, you take whatever you My life. If your glory wants to come in, let it fall. We want it all. Lord, your fire is consuming. Fill this place, set it ablaze, and, and I'll be a
Can we praise the name of Jesus this morning? Amen, amen. Who's glad to be at church today? We'll turn around and welcome somebody to Rivers Crossing this morning. Good morning, Rivers Crossing. If I haven't met you yet, my name is Freddie. And uh, I'm so thankful that you've joined us this morning. If it's your first time, we want to welcome you with a gift. There's in the Welcome Center outside after service in the lobby. There's a big black flag. It says new here, and a member of our team would love to meet you and give you a gift as well. If, uh, if you haven't already, make sure you're following us on social media and uh, you download the RC app, you can, have, you can watch past sermons, you can uh, take advantage of the sermon notes that are in there, and also stay up to date on all things happening here at Rivers Crossing, like baptism and Wobi. Uh, here at Rivers Crossing, I have the honor and privilege of serving as one of our drummers, and I believe I can speak for everyone on the worship team and say it's an honor, it's truly a privilege to usher in the Spirit of God with you every single week. So today, we have some exciting news from Pastor Rand and Ethan. What's up, everybody? It's Rand and Ethan from Rivers Crossing Worship, and we have a very exciting announcement for you today. Yeah, come and see Live From Church, the full-length album is releasing Friday, November the 3rd on all of our platforms. So at the top of this year, um, we decided we were gonna call this uh, Live From Church, no matter what songs came out of it, because uh, the vision we felt like God gave our team was that while there's nothing wrong with live recordings and we'll probably do them in the future, uh, we wanted to capture these songs just in the different spaces of our church uh, so that you're not just hearing one moment that we spent with God, but you're hearing what it sounds like to come and see what God is doing here at Rivers Crossing. Yeah, some of these songs were, were recorded at our Mason campus, at our Deer Park campus, and our student venue here at the Mason campus as well. Uh, these are just really cool pictures of what our church sounds like, whether that's just on a Wednesday night for our tribes ministry, a Deer Park service on Sunday morning, or even a Mason service on Sunday morning as well. Yeah, so we're so excited for the way that this whole record has turned out. Um, we hope that it really blesses our church, um, that it maybe even blesses churches beyond our house. Um, so we hope that on Friday, November 3rd, you'll take some time out to listen to Come and See Live from Church, the, the new full-length album from Rivers Crossing Worship. Well, good morning, everybody. How are we doing today? I can be the first to tell you that I am super excited for our full-length album, Come and See. It's gonna be amazing. There's incredible songs on there. And in fact, one of the songs is actually really close to my heart because I'm actually the high school director here and I get to serve on staff doing that. And we have a song on there that our high school team, our junior high team, our students team helped write called Young. And it is an amazing song. We're super excited for it to release on the album. It's already actually released, but a couple of weeks Weeks ago, we got the opportunity to come in here, and some of you guys saw, did you guys see maybe a couple weeks ago, the student ministry came in here and was jumping around, having fun, and it was an awesome time to see that, but I wanted to take a second to just say that 
we have a thriving student ministry here because of the leadership that we have at this church. Pastor Paul, after we sang that amazing song, preached a passionate and incredible message about the next generation. And I have to tell you that our pastor is more passionate about the next generation than anybody I know. And I wanna give it up for him and Pastor Paul and Farah as we continue today and just honor them and thank them. It's also Pastor Appreciation Month, if you didn't know that, so make sure you say thank you for all that they do on a week in and week out basis. They are amazing. Now, I have to tell you, if you don't know me, my name is Joel, and it's nice to meet you, um, but one thing about me is that I'm a huge, huge Bengals fan, and I watch every Sunday. Yeah, it, 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 actually, I expected more cheers than that, honestly, because apparently there's not many Bengals fans in the room. We're in Cincinnati, just to remind you. Um, they play the 49ers today, super excited for that, but I actually wanted to start my message by telling you that next week they play the Bills on Sunday Night Football, and I actually happen to have an extra ticket. Would anybody be interested in going with me? Okay, oh, oh, wow, two people stood up. What a coincidence. Okay, all right, well, we got a Bengals fan over here. He's got a tiger hat on. That's commitment, that's commitment. Can we give it up for the Bengals fan? Absolutely. I don't even know if I wanna look on this side, personally. So I'm just gonna say this, just looking a little bit to the side. But um, first of all, why are you even here? <laughs> this is Cincinnati, this is not Cleveland, and also uh, Johnny Manziel hasn't played a snap in years. But on top of that, I would never take you to a Bengals game. I actually would be embarrassed to see, be seen in public with you, I'm sorry. Oh, come on, he's a Browns fan! <laughs> actually, church, before you sit down, can we collectively boo this man? <laughs> boo! You can take a seat. <laughs> Security, you can take care of that. <laughs> if you're wondering what in the world has happened, or you're shocked at the way I just treated that man, I, I wanna just talk about a similar situation that happens. If you didn't know, we're in a series in the book of James, and I get chapter two, the beginning of it, and in chapter two, James sets up a similar thing to what just happened. And if you have your physical Bibles or if you have your Bible app, would you go to James 2, 1, and we're gonna read one through four. So this is how it starts off. James says this, my brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into a meeting wearing gold rings and fine clothes or Bengals jerseys. Suppose, and a poor man in filthy old clothes or otherwise known as a brown Steelers or Ravens jersey also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, hey, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet or collectively boo them. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? So what I want to let you all know is if you boo today, you're evil. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But James is setting up this idea of favoritism and the reality is is that like we just saw in a very silly example, we saw that there was favoritism in the room towards the Bengals fan and not so much towards the Browns fan. And in James' time, he is setting up this context that it wasn't Bengals, and I don't think the Bengals existed back then. I don't think the Browns existed back then, but what I do know is that there was a, a societal issue between the rich and the poor. There was an issue that the rich were exploiting the poor, that the rich would look down upon the poor, and that people would have favoritism towards the rich. It wasn't just in that, but what James is setting up is that the sin issue in this situation was not in the rich man wearing gold rings or fine clothes or a Bengals jersey. The, the issue was not in the man wearing poor, raggedy, filthy clothes or maybe smelling a little bit. I don't know. The issue was not in any of that. The sin was not in any of that. What the sin was in was in the people who were watching and choosing to show favoritism based on an appearance, based on what somebody looked like. And James is setting up this idea and he's basically saying that in the church and in our lives as Christians, we have no place and we absolutely cannot show favoritism. In fact, he closes up with talking about judges with evil thoughts, that when we discriminate, when we show favoritism towards one person or another, that we are judges with evil thoughts. 
I wanna give you the definition of favoritism. Favoritism is the practice of giving unfair prefer preferential treatment to a person or group of people at the expense of another person or group. Like I said, James closes with this idea that when we discriminate, we become judges with evil thoughts. To be more specific, at that time, what he was referring to is that judges in the courts, they would treat the poor unfairly. They would rule in favor of the rich many times. They would judge based on appearance and based on possession. And because of that, they would rule unfair judgments. They would have evil thoughts. In fact, if you really look, what it really means is that he was really saying that it was judges who take bribes. Judges who treat people better because they know that they might get a better result for themselves. James continues to go further in this direction in verse five when he talks about, listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into the courts? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him whom you belong? See, James is not saying that God favors the rich or the poor. What he's setting up is the idea that when you are maybe a little bit less fortunate and you don't have as much wealth, you don't have as much to cling to on this world and in this earth, temporary things, the type of clothing you wear, the type of cars you drive. When you don't have as much, you're more likely to cling to the person who matters, Jesus Christ, because he's the only thing that you got. And not only that, on top of that, the, the, the people who were rich at that time were exploiting the poor and if you really think about it, if you look back in James' time, James would have actually identified with the poor group of people. Actually, Jesus would have identified with the poor group of people as well. Because of that, when the rich were exploiting the poor, they were actually exploiting, and when we exploit the poor, they were exploiting the very people group that our Savior came from. And he's setting this idea up because James was very passionate He's very passionate about seeing no favoritism within believers. Whether someone was rich, what their economic status was, or whoever they were, whatever they wore, whatever they did, James did not want us to show favoritism. I ask in this room for all of us, have any of us, if we were to look into our hearts, last week, Pastor Paul did an amazing job of preaching a message about the word of God. You should go back and watch it if you haven't, it was awesome. But he talks about how the word of God is like a mirror. And sometimes we have to take this mirror and we have to look into our own hearts. And I need to ask the question, is there anywhere in our hearts, if we were to, to take this mirror in, in the passages we're gonna read today, is there anywhere in our hearts where we have become judges with evil thoughts in our workplace, in our neighborhoods, because someone's from a different neighborhood, because someone is a different color than us, because someone is from a different background, nationality, because someone is in a different school district, because someone works beneath us, because someone is above us, so we elevate them and we lower everybody else. See, favoritism is not to be had in the church and I can tell you exactly why. What James was warning about was because he knew that favoritism was something that the enemy tries to use to divide relationships, to divide the church, and to divide people. Favoritism will divide the church if we allow any ounce of it into our church, into our hearts, and we must treat it aggressively. We must treat it aggressively today. When we go out of this room today, we must see, is there any part of us that has become a judge with evil thoughts? Ephesians 4, four through six says this. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. This is the type of unity that we should have as the church, that there is one God and he lives through all and in all. 
And no matter what our lives look like, what we have, what we do, as long as we have that relationship with Jesus, nothing can change his love for us. Nothing can change the fact that his kingdom calls us to be unified. And you know why? You know why the enemy tries to use favoritism and discrimination and things like that? It's because he once understood what unity looked like. Satan used to be in heaven, he was Lucifer. And he understood what it looked like when people and when angels would get together and they would worship God as one. And he knows the power that comes from when the church gets unified. He knows the power that comes from when when people who are followers of Jesus get unified under one name and when God works through all and in all. He knows what happens when we love everybody despite who they are. And he does not want that for us. The enemy wants to disrupt our lives and he wants to disrupt our unity. And he does it a lot through favoritism. And that's why we must treat it aggressively. I know many of you in this room, you might be in here and you might say, well, I don't struggle with favoritism. And for some, that might be the case. But I would be willing to say that a lot of us do, and even if it's small or even if it's big. And in fact, uh, in Acts, we see a story of the apostle Peter. And Peter, if you didn't know this, actually had some favoritism in his life. His favoritism was he would favor the Jews over the Gentiles. And we see this story in Acts when he goes to a Gentile man's house and he sees the great faith that he has. And Peter has this moment where he realizes something. And in Acts 10, 34, it says this. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. For some of us in this room, we need to have a moment like Peter did, where we now realize, even if we didn't realize it before, that we now realize that maybe, just maybe, even if it's the smallest amount, that we have a little bit of favoritism in our life. I wanna talk about two ways that I believe James really talk, like two things that James really brings up in this illustration, two things that James really wants us to understand but I wanna kinda umbrella it by this one statement, and I want you to remember this statement, and this is what it says. If we want to change how we think of people, we must change how we see people. If we want to change how we think of people, we must change how we see people. I would be willing to say as well to change it to, if we want to change how we treat people, we must change how we see people. And really that's what James is saying is that there can be no favoritism. And I wanna talk about two areas of favoritism that I think in a society we struggle with and in our own lives we struggle with. And the first one is this, appearance. Appearance Appearance-based favoritism. See, James mentions the idea, he very specifically says, well, the rich man was wearing gold rings and fine clothes. The poor man was wearing filthy old clothes. Why do you think he mentions that? It's an important detail because he knew that a lot of people would look on the outside and see appearance. And because they would see appearance, they would judge and they would have evil thoughts into their mind that this person isn't worth my attention. This person isn't worth it. This person must have sinned. This person must not deserve my honor or my acceptance. And they would look at appearance and he knew that. And I wish that I could tell you today that it was different. I wish I could stand up here and say, we've learned from that. But the reality is, is that some of us haven't. And in fact, in this society, we see that a Harvard study, I came across this recently, a Harvard study confirmed that workers above average beauty earn about 10 to 15% more than workers of below average beauty. Everyone in this room is thinking, well, thank God I'm in part of the 10 to 15%. But this is crazy. Just because of someone's appearance, we already see in our society that our jobs are even permeated by favoritism. Some of you are gonna have a conversation with your boss tomorrow. I'm kidding, don't do that, don't do that. But 10 to 15% of people, they are making more money just because of what they look like. And we know that that is not what God cares about. 
and we're gonna get there in just a second, but appearance-based favoritism doesn't just stop there. It's not just about wearing good clothes or having favoritism based on what someone looks like in, in, in the, the landscape of what they wear or what they look like or what they drive. But unfortunately, it also, in society, has, favoritism has fueled some really bad things. It's become about color of skin in the past and even today. It's become about wars. It's become and fueled things in society that have led to, to hatred and division. And it has to stop today in our hearts. And I'm not saying just because you buy into a little bit of favoritism that you have anything to do with those horrible things I just mentioned. I'm not saying that at all. But what I do know the Bible says is this, it's very clear. It says in Proverbs 28, 21, Playing favorites is always a bad thing. You can do great harm in seemingly harmless ways. See, the size of favoritism, whether big, whether small, it has to be dealt with. Because even if it seems harmless to you, it can do great harm to someone else. And that's important to understand as we move forward. I wanna point out the fact that there is a part of our culture that I think has been very neglected. There's a people group of our culture that has been very neglected. And I wanna specifically talk about our homeless population. My wife, she's amazing, I love her so much. She used to work a job where she actually would help homeless veterans find housing. And she did a great job at it and she had so many success stories and, and just the amazing thing that came out of that. And what we learned was so incredible, but she learned of a statistic and this is the statistic, that a homeless person can go a whole month without even hearing their own name. Let that sink in for a second. There are people who live right here in America, in our city, around us, that can go a whole month without even hearing their own name. I don't know about you, but if I were to go one day without hearing my own name, I'd be concerned. It would feel very bad, wouldn't it? And what my wife has started to do is, is she started to, to realize that it's more important, see, it's important to meet needs, right? The Bible talks about it all the time. In fact, over 200 times the Bible mentions the poor. It talks about it a lot. It talks about these people a lot people who are less fortunate than us. And it's important to meet their needs. So what my wife will do and, and what we do now is we keep in our center console, we keep snacks. So if there's anybody who's homeless that we pass by and they have a sign and they're asking for money or anything, we'll at least give them a snack because we know they must be hungry. We mo they must be hungry. But not only that, but the next thing that she'll do that has really radically changed my life and my perspective is that she'll ask them their name. She'll hand them, she'll meet a need, and then she'll ask them their name because she understands that it's not just about meeting someone's need, but it's about seeing them and valuing them for being another human being created by the same God. And the reality is, is that when we ask someone their name, we give them honor. And we help them to hear, oh, do we help remind them that I am a human being created by the same God you are? And even though we know that, that it could have been uncontrolled that they're in that position, it also could have been sin, but who are we to judge? The Bible says that we should not become judges with evil thoughts. But sometimes these thoughts come in our head, and, and I would be the first to tell you that I've had moments like that in my life. I will be very vulnerable with you. But understanding that someone can go a whole month without hearing their name is heartbreaking. And I know as the church that we can do a better job of caring for this community. And I know as a person, I can do a better job and we can all do a better job. But most importantly today, it starts with us dealing with any favoritism in our life. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 16, 7, the Lord does not look at things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. We cannot be concerned about the filth of someone's outward appearance when we should be concerned about the filth in our own hearts. 
And I'm not saying again that everyone in this room struggles with the same thing, but I am saying that even if there's a little bit, the church should see differently. See, Jesus calls us by name. He sees us for who we are, not for what we look like. Jesus himself sees us. He knows the number of hairs on our head because he loves us and he wants to give us value. That's why he calls us by name. And in the same way, we should be that way for others, that we should not care about what someone else looks like, but care about who they are. And I believe if we could do that as the church, if we could see differently, it would change everything when it comes to appearance-based favoritism. The second thing that I believe James brings up is this, possessions, possessions. James 2, eight through 11, he continues talking about favoritism, and he says this, if you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. Let's stop there for a second. I just wanna be a person who loves. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. And if you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. At that time, James saw two things. He saw first that people would use this whole commandment of love your neighbor as yourself as an excuse to actually favor the rich. That group of people, they would say, oh, well, well James, I'm loving my neighbor. He just happens to have a Tesla. He just happens to have a Lamborghini. He just happens to be giving me money. But did they really love those people because of who they were or because of their possessions? See, they would use that as an excuse. Well, I'm loving my neighbor. Well, then why are you not treating the poor man with filthy old clothes the same way you're treating this rich man with gold rings? If you were really loving your neighbor as yourself, you were doing right but you must love everybody. And then he's saying this idea of of these sins that he brings up. He says, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. He's using this example of sins. He's saying, if you commit Murder, but you don't commit adultery, you're still breaking the law, which means that favoritism in itself is a sin just like anything else. But he's also saying that you cannot pick and choose who you love like you try to pick and choose sins. You cannot pick and choose based on the value of what someone can give you. And I think oftentimes in in our lives, we can struggle with this, that we see possessions too much. I told, said it earlier, I, I told you that I'm, I'm a, huge fantasy, a huge football fan. And I have a fantasy football team. And if you think it's dumb, it is, and that's the reality. And I probably have too many. And it takes up way too much of my time. Some of you are right there with me. In fact, last week I actually lost a game because one of my players had the audacity to get sick. Can you believe that? Like, come on. But seriously, how silly is that? But, but we draft, see, see what fantasy football is, just to set it up for you very briefly, is that you draft real life players to your team and if they perform well, they get you a lot of points. You like a lot of points. So you draft people who you think are gonna be good. And then you have a team and you play other teams who have other real life players and they play their games and whoever has the most points at the end wins the game. Pretty simple concept. But I think as I I was prepping this message, God really brought to mind something that actually scared me a little bit. As I was thinking about this message, fantasy football was brought to mind and it wasn't just because I needed to set my lineup, but it was because I think sometimes in life we can treat people like fantasy football players. Meaning that we assign a value based on what they can give us, the goals they can help us achieve, what they have, and their ability to help us. And then we bench, or we cut, or we trade the people who have nothing to offer us. 
That's what happens in fantasy football. See, if a player doesn't perform to how I like, then I can trade them, I can cut them, I can bench them. Some of us, we have, a, we have a fantasy of how we want our life to go. We have this dream, and if someone doesn't help us get there, then we don't value them like we should. And we view them based on their possessions, on what they can give us. I wanna read a scripture that was brought up last week by Pastor Paul, and it's also in James, and it's James 1.18, and it says this. He chose to give birth to us, by giving us his true word. And we, out of all creation, became his prized possession. One of the best ways to beat favoritism in our life is to stop viewing people for their possessions and start viewing them as God's prized possession. It's to stop looking at people for what they can offer us and start looking for what we can offer them. Because even though Someone might not be, even though they talked your ear off at coffee and it was all about their problems, even though you had to listen for hours on that phone call that you wanted to get off of, even though that person came to your office and took up your whole day, do you understand that that could have changed their entire life? And sometimes people don't have much to offer us, but we have everything to offer them. And God has placed them in your life, just like we talk about our eight to 15. God has strategically placed them in your life. This is specifically talking about non-believers. But he has strategically placed them in your life to give the gospel. I believe that God strategically places people in our lives that we can offer something to, that we can love, that we can show the mercy and the grace of God to that could change their entire life. And I'm telling you, more than I would ever want a Tesla or something that was nice or a lot of money or to be rich, I just wanna be rich in faith and see someone come to faith because of my actions, because of the way I follow Jesus. I would way rather have that. And I believe in this place today that we can get to the point as a church where we believe that too. What if instead of seeing someone for their possessions, we saw them as God's prized possession? Earlier I brought up uh, illustration in the room and you know I also happen to have some jerseys up here and you can see this is a Browns jersey right this is my favorite absolutely favorite Joe Burrow jersey and if I don't wear it they lose (laughs) but here's the thing obviously we can see that there's differences in fact some of us booed this one some of us wanted to boo this one but we were scared for our life but there are differences. And you can see that maybe this team represents something different. They, they represent another city, they represent another place. And, and this team represents another city, they're from another place. They look different on the outside. But if you were to look on the inside, you would see that they're made by the same manufacturer. And I wanna challenge you today that would you see someone, despite what they look like on the outside, as being made and created by the same God that created you, as being a prized possession of the God who created us and who wants a relationship with us. James closes this entire thought by talking about something really powerful. In James 2, 2 through 13, or uh, sorry, 12 through 13, it says, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. But mercy triumphs over judgment. Thank God that mercy triumphs over judgment. See, what James was trying to get us to understand is that the only difference between any of us is whether or not we have a relationship with Jesus. We are all broken, we all fall short, and he's trying to get everyone in this room and everyone at that time to understand that we are all broken, that we all fall short, that we are all in need of a savior, and that we are all should be so thankful that mercy triumphs over judgment. That mercy loves us where we're at. 
no matter what we have, no matter what we look like, that mercy would triumph over the judgment that God is a just God. He's a, he, he will judge based on the things that people do unless if they have come into a right relationship with Jesus who shows mercy through the gospel and through the cross and through his resurrection. And because mercy triumphs over judgment, in God, even with God, mercy can triumph over judgment in our lives too. And James is helping us understand that we're all in the same place. Mercy gives everyone an invite to God's family. No matter what your background is, no matter how much money you have, no matter what neighborhood you're from, what color of skin you are, what nationality you are, mercy gives everyone an invite. I recall a story my grandpa told me and it was about a man named Leroy Meeks. And Leroy was a man who was invited to this event that my grandpa was invited to as well. And at this event, there were a few different characteristics I'll name. There was success, there was money, there was education and degrees. In fact, the owner of Dunkin' Donuts was there. That's pretty cool. Thank God for that guy. But Leroy would stand up here and tell you himself that that was not his story. In fact, Leroy was uneducated. He didn't have the the riches that everyone else had. There was actually nothing, and he would tell you this himself, there was nothing that would have connected him to anybody in that room. And my grandpa was standing there and Leroy came up to him and he put his arm around him and said one of the most powerful statements that I've ever heard. He said, Phil, which is my grandpa's name, if it wasn't for Jesus, I wouldn't be here. He's the only thing we all have in common. There's a verse in Galatians, it's 3, 26 through 28, and it says this. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. See, all of these areas that the world used to assign inequality to, Jesus says that there is not inequality, and in fact, through faith in the gospel and through a relationship with Jesus, we are all made into unity We are all designed to be into unity and in the family of God, in the kingdom of God. And if I I know anything, that this picture of Leroy being in a place where he might not have felt like he belonged, but he belonged because of Jesus, is exactly what heaven's gonna look like. Because that type of unity does not have to wait till heaven, though. It can be right now in this church, in our lives, if we can get rid of favoritism if we can get rid of discrimination, if we can get rid of any ounce of us that is not unified with our brothers and our sisters in Christ or the people who don't know Jesus, if we could love like Jesus loves, if we could see people for who they are as a human being in a prized possession as opposed to what they have or what they look like, if we could just understand this James teaching and walk out of this room different and walk out of this room loving people no matter what, then I believe that we would see revival, we would see people come to Jesus like never before. And as the church, we have an opportunity to be the most welcoming and loving place that anybody would ever step foot into. And I believe that's what it's gonna be like here. I wanna pray for us. God, thank you so much for your mercy. It triumphs over judgment. That even though we all deserved the death that Jesus died, he came and he took our place and he loved us right where we were at. And no matter where we are, we can understand that because of that sacrifice, because of that love for us, we can be saved even though we deserve to be judged by the sins that we've committed, mercy, triumphs over judgment. So God, would you help us to have that kind of love in our lives, that kind of mercy in our lives, 
And would you get rid of and demolish any favoritism in this room so we can walk out with mercy triumphing in our lives every single day? In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Well, I just wanna say thank you so much for being here. And if you're someone in this room who needs prayer, maybe you just uh, have some favoritism in your life and you wanna speak to someone about that, I wanna let you know that there are gonna be prayer partners up here that can pray for you. I also wanna let you know that none of this would exist without your generosity. And I talked about being the high school director and 205 high schoolers were there on Wednesday, which is incredible, but that's because of your generosity. And I'm so thankful for everyone who gives to that mission and that vision and seeing young people and people even old or whoever they are come to Jesus. So thank you guys so much for being here this Sunday. We will see you next week as we continue in the book of James.